Hello, and thanks for tuning in to the show that goes around the continent to bring you stories near and far. I'm Joke Rogers at Channels Television here in Lagos, and I'm joined by Vincent Macquarie from The Voice of America in Washington. Well, thanks. I'm Vincent Macquarie at The Voice of America. Happy to be with you again for another edition of Africa 54. Let's start off with the latest from Nigeria. Channels Television in Lagos brings you that story. The House of Representatives has rescinded its decision on three gender constitution bills that were rejected outright by both chambers of the National Assembly because it failed to secure the mandatory two-thirds votes during the voting on the proposed amendments to the 1999 Constitution. The lawmakers made this resolve at their plenary on Tuesday, March 8, after protests from women groups who marked this year's International Women's Day with its theme, breaking the bias, which is what the proponents of these bills want to achieve. The bills to be recommitted for consideration border on citizenship, indigenship, and the 35% affirmative action for women. Plenary commences in the Green Chamber, and lawmakers immediately go into an executive session. Executive session. When the doors are opened, it is clear that an important conversation has just been had. The House, in its wisdom, has decided to take a course of action for the good of the country. Following public outcry and constant protests by women and civil society organizations over the five women bills which were rejected by the National Assembly, the Speaker announces that three of the bills are to be recommitted and reconsidered. After the recession, release them on the next set of amendments coming up. I believe, Deputy Speaker, in the next four weeks, the Constitution, I believe under Section 5, allows the House to regulate its own procedure. And we will be relying on the provision of the Constitution to harmonize the differences between us and the Senate. <laughs> Both chambers had voted against constitution bills to provide for 35% affirmative action for women in political party administration, special seats for women in national and state houses of assembly, allow women to take up indigenship of their husband's state after five years, as well as to allow foreign women to take up citizenship of their Nigerian husbands. Reacting to the U-turn by the House, the highest ranking woman in the House of Representatives is hopeful that the leadership of the House would lobby the Senate to follow suit. It's the leadership like the presiding officer should talk with the Senate because they have to meet. Of course, the Speaker has to uh, speak with the uh, Senate President because this is the right thing to do. It's not about anybody. It's about our nation. It's about uh, the ridiculous nature of failure of those bills to pass. She explains why the bill of special seats was not yeah, recommitted. They believe that INEC had concluded all the processes and procurement for 2023 general elections. The bill to provide for a minimum of 35% for women in ministerial and commissioner nominees was however not mentioned. The bill was among the five women bills which failed last week when it was not passed by the Senate, although the House had passed it at 20%. Terry Ikumi, Channels Television News. Joining us to discuss this is a lawyer, human rights advocate, a Mandela Washington Fellow, and Mandela Rhodes Scholar, Janet Bam. Glad to have you on Africa 54 today. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be here. So the House of Representatives has just rescinded its decision to reconsider the pro-women bills after protests from women across the three states and the commercial capital, Lagos. So do the lawmakers need this pressure to reconsider their stance? Um, I do not believe the lawmakers need such pressure to reconsider their stance. But also historically looking at Nigeria as a country and even Africa as a broader continent, prejudices against women have always been there. And sometimes they may be subtle, but in this instance, it goes to the core, which is policy. And the fact that we are discussing issues like this in 2022, especially when Nigerian lawmakers and even Nigerian men are quick to compare Nigerian women and women in Africa as a whole to women in the West, 
but are quick to shy away from taking responsibilities on issues, especially because women in the West are now, you know, going up to big leadership positions. You can see recently Kamala Harris and um, Nancy Pelosi were at the congressional session. They presided over the session. But you see, these are issues that we are quick to pick the good issues from the West or things that favor us without necessarily looking back and uh, um, also applying some of these things back in Nigeria and Africa as a whole to issues that really progress. So I really do not believe that um, such pressure was even needed in the first place if we had a strong constitution that um, was upholding equality, which is the core of any democracy and strong constitution. So, Vikanda, there's room for second chances here, since there's going to be a second oh, yeah. round. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's going to be, you know, a second round of an amendments. Do you see the Senate following suits reconsidering the bills, although the women say they want five over five and not three over five? Oh, yes, please. It has to be five over five. Look, if you take a look at the bills, when I looked at everything, I am asking myself, how do you shy away from others and only pick? This is not a cherry picking thing where you cherry pick what works for you. It has to be the fight because this is an opportunity. I, I think I'm seeing this as an opportunity for the lawmakers to do something that is right for once. Because I also believe that all the lobbying processes have been done and people have come out to work. Even the two the first ladies of them, that's Aisha Buhari and um, Osiba Doswai, were there at the National Assembly. It's never been heard of before in the history of a bill at both houses where the first ladies have to go to lobby. This shows you that this is at the core of women and so many people are just looking and watching and hoping that for once we get it right and when i was watching the protests on television i could see that even the eu delegations the embassy so many people came out with manifesto so many women groups were out there this shows that this is something that is at the heart of every woman in nigeria and it would be a shame if the response is still a no so you have consulted uh, on several gender issues, uh, both for uh, the World Bank and USAID. Do you see this rejection in the first place as a setback for democracy in the country? When you see with the way issues have been handled in Nigeria, especially going back with how um, civil spaces are being shrunk, even the media is being clamped on, people's views are not really expressed. And then with something like this bill coming and happening it shows the setback that if we were truly in a democracy such issues would be handled differently but i think i also see this um, as an opportunity as i said earlier for the legislators to prove us right that indeed we are in a democracy and i really hope and sincerely hope that they take this opportunity to do what is right <laughs> okay Glad to have uh, had you on the program today, Janet Bam. Uh, thank you for speaking to us today on Africa 54. Um, it's my pleasure. Thank you. Kenya's nomadic herders are among those suffering the most from recurring drought that kills the livestock they depend on. To make them less dependent on rain, aid programs are teaching Kenya's herders how to farm fish and keep bees. Brenda Molina reports from Isiolo, Kenya. The arid and semi-arid parts of Kenya have been in the grips of a cyclical drought since last year that threatens the lives of nearly 2 million people. Pastoral communities who depend on livestock are counting their losses and facing an uncertain food security. But Makai Mamu, a pastoralist turned farmer, hasn't had to worry about how to feed her family during this dry period. She has been rearing fish on her farm for the last two years and it is paying off. As other pastoralists struggle to feed their family during this drought, she has enough to eat and sell. During the drought, we can't buy food in the market. All the goats are too thin, but with fish, we are happy. Fish rearing was introduced to Isiolo, a county in the northern parts of Kenya, in 2019 by the county government in collaboration with the World Food Program. The initiative is meant to cushion residents from the effects of extreme weather conditions like droughts and floods. After drought or floods, we were given food 
two communities. But we then realized over time that it was not sustainable. The Sustainable Food Systems Program has seen parcelists like Makai try other types of farming aside from livestock. The county government of Isiolo says diversifying sources of livelihood has helped lessen the impact of droughts that have hit the county and surrounding areas every few years. We have phase two that's coming in. We are targeting 40 fish farmers. Uh, we are hoping that uh, with time they'll be able to see fish as other livestock. The program has grown from 15 groups to more than 50, and individual farmers now farm and consume the fish as well as practice crop farming, hay production, and beekeeping. The program aims to reach close to a thousand groups in the next five years. Brenda Molina for VOA News in Isiolo, Kenya. I guess it won't hurt to celebrate women just one more time. In South Africa, more experienced women entrepreneurs spent this year's International Women's Day, which held on the 8th of March, up close with less experienced ones, what the event organizers called Mentor Rings. Channel's Television South Africa Bureau Chief Betty Dibia brings us that story. I just stand in awe, and today for me it's just an absolute honor to be called woman. The room was filled with accomplished women, old and young, as well as a handful of supportive men. They paid respects to long gone, as well as present accomplished women. Speaker after speaker touched on the importance of fearlessness in pursuit of aspirations, commitment to community development, volunteering, and especially mentoring of other women. My husband likes to do this. He says, put your hands like this. Let someone's foot be there and lift them up. And then you let go. Then you take your hands away. They are climbing. And let someone stand on your shoulders. All these women, I offer my shoulders, and I know all these women who spoke, they are offering their shoulders. Stand on our shoulders, and then, but then you must step up. I keep on telling people, I have an MD and a PhD. My PhD is Doctor of Philosophy. But a PhD could also be pull her down. We do not want to pull women down. We want to bring them up. That's my message. As part of the push towards mentoring, the event broke into what was called mentorings, where older and upcoming entrepreneurs sat up close to ask and answer questions and share experiences. <laughs> We asked some of the event attendees what stood out for them and their message to the world on the International Women's Day. We are not prisoners of our past, but we are actually the architects of our future. And we have to really think of uh, um, uh, investing and, uh, and shaping our own future. And I think that's what we've been learning and hearing today of the inspirational woman. It was great. I enjoyed every moment of it. I enjoyed being with people who are successful in life and in business. I say, woman, you are the mother of uh, the nation. Uh, you are very strong. You are capable. So whatever you put in your mind, so you should not be prevented I can say, uh, with your ideas that you want to implement to the world. Whether it's in your household, whether it's your own daughter, your girl child, or the community girls, let's sort of bring them all together and make sure that they are successful, successful business people, successful mothers, and successful daughters to their families. They also spread a thought for women and children in conflict zones around the world today. Every woman who is in a conflict area, we are saying that you will be supported and that you need to um, give yourselves to understand that it is not the end of the world. The theme for this year's International Women's Day is gender equality today for a sustainable tomorrow and the hashtag is break the bias. The hope is for the theme to go beyond being just one year's theme to a lifelong reality. From Johannesburg, South Africa, Betty Dibia, Channels Television News. It's time now for a short break. As we do, we remind you to visit our website, channelstv.com, for news and programming around the clock. You can also find us at youtube.com forward slash channelsweb. Still to come on the program, Perseverance and Confidence show in the artistry of Chaima Gador through music and dance. She shares those traits with Tunisia's children with disabilities. 
Welcome back to Africa 54. I'm Vincent McCory in Washington. Millions of people around the world enjoy drinking coffee, but the daily caffeine fix could be under threat because climate change is killing coffee plants. As Andrew Ridgewell reports, scientists in London are working with farmers in Africa to find a solution. Outside the vast glass houses at London's Kew Botanic Gardens, the temperature is below freezing. Inside, the heat and humidity replicate a tropical jungle. Aaron Davis leads Kew's research into coffee. This is Arabica coffee, our preferred coffee, the one we drink in, in high streets and at home. It has a superior taste. And this coffee provides us with about 60% uh, of the coffee that we drink globally. The other species over here is Robusta coffee. Uh, so this, this has a slightly larger leaf. Um, this coffee provides us with the other 40% of the world's coffee supply. The cultivation of Arabica and Robusta coffee beans supports millions of livelihoods across Africa, South America and Asia. But they're under threat because of climate change. The solution could be growing deep in the forests of West Africa. There are around 130 species of coffee plant, but not all taste good. In Sierra Leone, Davis and his team identified one candidate growing in the wild, Stenophylla. And this is extremely heat tolerant and is an interesting species because it matches Arabica in terms of its uh, superb taste. A further two coffee species also show promise for commercial cultivation in a changing climate, Liberica and Eugeniades. That has low yields <laughs> and very small beans, but it has an amazing taste. The team at Kew Botanic Gardens is working with farmers in Africa on cultivating the new coffees commercially. Catherine Kiwuka oversees the projects in Uganda. What requirements do they need? How do we boost its productivity? Instead of it being dominated by only two species, we have the opportunity to tap into the value of other coffee species. It's hoped that substantial volumes of Liberica coffee will be exported from Uganda to Europe this year. Researchers hope it will provide a sustainable income for farmers and an exciting new taste for coffee drinkers. Henry Ridgewell for VOA News, London. One Tunisian woman, Kayama Gador, is considering her disability a blessing and helping children in similar circumstances through the arts. This she does by holding workshops to instill in them a concept of perseverance and confidence Despite congenital deformity in her fingers and legs, the canoon player and classical dancer has won many national and international awards. Chayama Gador was once bullied for being born with four of her fingers and four of her toes stuck together. At the age of eight, she learned to play the only instrument she could navigate with her best defect, not knowing it will become alive nearly 20 years later. I was born with a congenital deformity in my fingers and legs. Since I was young, I was subjected to a lot of bullying and bad things from adults and young people. This bullying left me with a lot of sadness in my heart. The honor of BioArt, a Tunisian center teaching young children with disabilities, dance, musical instruments and singing, the 28-year-old ballet dancer, Quanon player, dance and music teacher aspires to teach the children how to gain confidence through art. Ballet dancing using my toes was a lot more difficult than playing the canoon with my fingers because it was one of the things I sacrificed a lot for and had many surgeries on my legs. But it's one of the things that I love so much that's why I was determined to learn it. She 
She started the center six years ago, a place where she describes as a big dream, where she hopes children like her can learn to push on despite their disabilities and the obstacles faced because of them. I aspire through this center to teach all children art because it helps them gain confidence, ambition and learn many human values. Chama Gado is a quantum player and a classical dancer who has won many national and international awards despite congenital deformity in her fingers and legs. Considering her disability a blessing, she also holds workshops for children to instill the concept of perseverance. Voice-activated virtual assistant technologies such as Siri and Alexa are becoming increasingly common around the world. But in Africa, with its many languages, most people are at a digital disadvantage. To address the problem, some African researchers are creating translation tools to recognize and promote indigenous languages such as Yoruba. Timothy Obiezu in Abuja has details. Yoruba language teacher Oluwa Femi Awosonya is struggling to migrate his class modules to his online student's blog site. Awosonya says he spends several hours manually editing and correcting his notes before uploading to his blog because there is no speech recognition technology for Yoruba. Awosanya has been teaching the language for 10 years and says despite technological advancement, African languages like Yoruba remain neglected. It limits knowledge. It limits the exhibition of knowledge. There are things you might wish you want to educate the student on. There are wish you want to, things you want to exhibit in the classes. But because there is limited materials. There are over 2,000 distinct languages spoken in Africa. But researchers say two-thirds of these languages are not included in emerging technologies, making it difficult for native speakers to use technology in local languages. Researchers say this threatens Africa's technological future. Nigerian writer and language advocate Kola Tubosun is trying to address the problem by creating an online Yoruba dictionary as well as a text-to-speech machine that translates English to Yoruba. If a language doesn't exist in the technology space, it is almost as if it doesn't exist at all. Um, that is the way the world is structured today, um, in that if you spend all your time online every day and the only language you encounter is English or Spanish or Mandarin or whatever else, then you tend to, um, it tends to define the way you interact with the world. Tubosun, who advocates for including African languages in technology, says the tech giants are starting to pay attention, but he admits the gap remains very wide. Language experts say it will take a long time before African languages are adopted in voice-driven technology. But in the meantime, researchers like Tubosun and Awosanya are working to adapt the Yoruba language for technology users. Timothy Obiezu for VOA News, Abuja, Nigeria. Well, and that's our show for today. You can find all the continent's top news and world news online at voaafrica.com. Check it out. I'm Vincent McCory in Washington. Channels Television has our last word from Lagos. We look forward to bringing you another show next week. Do remember that channelstv.com is your source for news and other programming. I'm Jocker Rogers. Thanks for watching and goodbye.